Hello, this is Manslave. Uh, I'm at work, so I kind of got to be quiet. It's uh, 6.33 p.m. Um, I'm at work, and I went all day today um, from 11 on up to the current time without any help uh, doing my job, putting away all the uh, merchandise and so forth, and literally all day, um, literally all day long, I've been the only man on the clock today. Uh, that means I've been the only male um, employee who's been working today. We only got three men employed here. We got around 12 um, females, 12 or 13 females employed here. So uh, women outnumber men four to one. And I was the only man on the clock today. Um, I come in to a whole bunch of work that needs to be done. And I'm doing it myself without saying anything to anybody. Not a peep. I, I occasionally interact with customers and coworkers, but like no complaints or whatever. You know, I don't. Com I didn't complain about. It. Anyway, anyway, like so many things demanded my attention. Every time, every time one of these female employees needed help with something, like you know, whenever there, basically, first of all, whenever there was heavy lifting, whenever there was a couch that was needed to be moved for a customer. Yeah, I did it myself. Um, one of the female cashiers said, Man, slave, don't you got anybody to help you? I said, no, I'm the only man on the clock today. I'm the only person who can lift this couch. And it was one that had a metal frame. So anyway, I go to haul it out. And it's like two guys and a woman. And they had a pickup truck, luckily. And they had a case of beer in the back. And I, I dropped the tailgate. And I put the beer. And I, I set it in the hands of the guy and basically suggested him to put it somewhere except for the truck bed. Because that's where we're going to put the couch. He got pissed at me. And put it back, and then lift up the tailgate, and told me to fucking lift this couch up above the fucking tailgate. Well, I'm put it up on there, and yeah, I got done, but like he was being all fucking picky about this and that. And the reason why he couldn't help was he had, he had a broken back. You know, in this community where I live, that's beginning to be a fucking cliche. You know, I mean, if it's if people are are really having that many broken backs, then the whole population needs to be rounded up and put in a nursing home if they're going to be that pathetic. If they're going to be that dumb as to not know how to lift something without injuring themselves. Anyway. And, um... So, um... Yeah, and then all the other, you know, carry out... And then all the messes and all the broken stuff and just correcting problems with procedure. And, mm -hmm. Dealing with the customers and display case. Yeah, it all fell on me. And, um, you know, I didn't have any help all day. And this is why I got behind on my work because everybody else had me doing stuff for them. Um... Couldn't exactly just say no because some of the people that told me to do stuff were managers. Um, the, the big problem came today is when I noticed every employee here had somebody helping them all day, except for me. I didn't ask for help and I didn't get any. I didn't expect any, but there's one thing I did expect: for people to just let me do my job. You know, and and, and to not get griped at for doing my job. Well, around the five o'clock hour, it was about an hour and a half ago, you know, manager comes up and says, you know, man slave, we're we're running out of, you know, carts and all that in the back. And um, yeah, that that just really upset me and offended me. <clears throat> because and um later on when they came out again and did it a second time, I just calmly said, It's like, you know why we're out of carts, don't you? Because everybody here has help except for me. You know, everybody's 
being made sure that they get their job done except for me. Basically, I'm being neglected. Too bad our store manager isn't here because uh, she's actually pretty cool on this stuff. She takes care of me pretty good and all that. Um, but, and then um, just a little while ago, here it is. I'm coming back here trying to use the bathroom or whatever. Well, actually, the assistant store manager um, had um, had me basically teach her how to hook up the um the the bottles and jugs and all that for like the cleaning chemicals to to the you know to the hose and all that and um i have to train everybody like so much of the time you know what i'm saying why can't they just figure things out so anyway and then uh, and then gunsley you know working in the back uh wanted me to help her do trash you know, and operate the compactor and put the trash in there for him. I just calmly told her, it's like, you know, I didn't have help all day. You know, it's like, you're, you're going to have to do it yourself. Cause like, you know, just wait till we close and all that and then do it then. <clears throat> and it's like everybody had help except for me. And then the, the assistant store manager, you know, uh, was smoothing the situation. Said, yeah, here, I'll help you. Mind, mind. And basically was, you know, taking my side of the situation yeah, I mean, what, how, I mean, how is that fair, you know? All right, resuming back along, it is 7.18 p.m. on uh, April 17th, 2013. Um, it's about 45 minutes after my first recording uh, for today. Uh, I got disrupted uh, because Gunsley, of whom I work with, uh... I don't know if you could hear her in the background, uh, but uh, she made a request for me to help her do her job instead of figure out how to operate the computer. It was simple. Here's the thing. Okay, she was scanning books, you know, barcodes on books at, uh, at the computer <clears throat> uh, workstation there. And... Um, she was scanning books, and apparently it was going just fine. Then all of a sudden, Internet Exploiter, Internet Exp Exploiter, you know, on the Microsoft's web browser, uh, you know, gave a message saying, you know, page could not be displayed. You know, it seemed like a, it would seem like an Internet connection problem or just the, basically the, the content or the page could not be displayed for whatever reason. And she's like, man, slave, oh, how do you get this thing working? Man, man, man. Well, I didn't know what was wrong with it. And here's these situations I get thrown into all the time. You know, or very often. Uh, you know, so I'm like, well, I don't know why it's screwed up. You know, all I could do is, like, assess the situation. It's like, well, the page is not displaying. You know, it's not like some freaking, like gear came out of like a, a, a wind up pocket watch or something like that I mean gosh so anyway um so um I hit the refresh button a couple times that doesn't seem to do anything so I hit the back button on the web browser and then it goes back to the previous page and I hit refresh again just to verify whether or not it's working and then it started working just fine See, Gunsley didn't know what the, you know, what the problem was. And then so she calls upon me, you know, Atlas, you know, or, or you know, the savior of the world as they put me in the position all the time of being. And uh, she says, man, so come fix this. What's wrong? Come fix this. So, um, and then I take an initial look and I didn't know what was wrong. But the difference is between me and Gunsley... I actually applied effort to figure out the problem and to resolve it. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, and then right after, um, right after a few minutes after that happened, um, the uh, the assistant store manager uh, came back there and and asked me if I would if uh, I would help Gunsley take out trash. Or do trash for Gunsley or whatever. Uh, this is the same Gunsley that uh, me and the disposable human doing talk about all the time. And uh, so anyway, um, so I'm like, wow. 
you know, I couldn't say no because then I'd get in trouble for insubordination. But, like, no is what really needed to be said. So I'm like, okay, whatever. You know, it's a nice, nice perfect end to a, you know, it's a nice end to a perfect day of just doing everything for everybody else all the time, even at the cost of getting my own job done, because I was the only Y chromosome on the time clock today. The only man who, you know, the only male employee who was at work today. I think the other two guys were scheduled off today or whatever. And yeah, I came in at 11 o'clock th this morning and then I got off work at 7 p.m. Right now it's 7.22 p.m. on April 17th, 2013. And uh, yeah, and, and, and sucked ass too. I come in and almost all of the carts full of merchandise were out there on the sales floor for me to put away all by myself. Well, guess what? Not long after, you know, I clocked on, well, like a couch needs to be taken out for a customer. Well, you know, I expected, uh, you know, the people working in the back to, to do the carryout because it's their job. You know, it's in, their and it's in their job description. It's their job to do that. Well, I was told that I have to go do it because uh, the person working in the back was on break. All the employees today were women except for me. Well, I handled that situation, you know, a couple fat-ass guys and a fat-ass woman uh, were all just, like, sitting on the couch, and I had to fucking wait for them to get up off their lazy asses, you know, and they're the ones that wanted the couch, and all that three people who wanted it, and they're like, oh, for heavy couch, yeah, it's got a metal frame, and I, you know, I take the flat cart up there, and I, I'm basically the only person employed there at this location who knows how to use the flat cart the most effective? And I can get it to do all kind of things, you know, that I would need to get it done, you know, in order to get my job done while only being one person. You know, like, like I'm in these situations so often where I'm the only person who either understands how to complete a task or is the only person physically capable of completing the task or the only person who will complete the task. Uh, and it sucks ass, you know. It sucks ass that I have to, you know, do multiple people's jobs while only getting one paycheck and all that. You know, we'll just put it into, you know, uh, equal pay for equal work type of framing like how uh, women usually do. Uh, women usually don't do equal uh, work uh, compared to men, but they sure do expect equal pay. Uh, it, you know, for any of you people who don't understand um, what this really understands what this means, it, equa it basically it, it, it's, it, it amounts to the female being very, very selfish and only seeing the rewards that men get or the benefits that men get while at the same time ignoring male sacrifice because women truly don't know what sacrifice is. Um, <clears throat> you know, and... Uh, so anyway, I was taking this, you know, I was putting this couch up on the flat cart myself, and like um, the female cashier, the female, the woman cashier said, well, man, slave, don't you get anybody to help you? And I said, I am the only man on the time clock today. I am the only man, uh, male employee in the entire building. I said, who else is going to do it? I'm the only person who can do it. And I said it right out in front of all the customers. Most of them were women. Yeah, and I said, I mean, I didn't say it really, really rude, but I was just like, I'm the only, I, I, but I, I, lately I've been saying things very, very plainly. You know, it's like, I'm the only person who can do it. Well, why don't you want some help? And it's like, I'm accustomed to not having help. You know, well, you want me to help you? Well, what help could you be? That's what I told her. I'm like, just go back over to your register. I've got this, Okay. So I get on there, I deal with it myself, then, you know, a little bit later, the female shift manager, because uh, all of our management is female, um, at this uh, place, and uh, so anyway, female uh, manager, uh, female uh, you know, shift manager came out and was trying to help me and all that, and I wasn't about to tell her to go leave me alone and all that, because, you know, it's insubordination, man, and I got in trouble for that one time. So anyway, <clears throat> I'm like, okay, whatever. 
And I didn't feel like arguing or whatever. And these fucking hillbilly slobs, um, the, you know, the, the two fat guys and the, the one fat woman, you know, and I'm not trying to discriminate against fat people because, you know, DHD or somebody else may have, uh, <laughs> may have revealed a little bit of my uh, preference in women. Uh, so those people who know that preference toward a type of woman... Uh, that I have, um, yeah, they know that I'm not a fat hater, so, uh, no, uh, the, uh, no, what I, what I should have said was lazy people, or just, you know, no, I should have actually said normal people, so anyway, they got him a pickup truck, it's like a Ford Ranger or something like that, so it's kind of a small pickup truck, and it's filled with a bunch of junk, Spare tire laying here, half of a concrete block there, a piece of a brick there, you know, like, just junk. And they got a case, but they got a nice case of beer, I think it was, was it Coors Light or was it Keystone Light or something like that. Um, and, uh, you know, a nice case of beer sitting in the back pickup truck. And, uh... <clears throat> So I'm like, you know, I'm going to have to drop the tailgate and get this thing in there, you know, the couch in there. So I drop the tailgate and um, take the case of beer and set it in the hands of uh, the one guy. And, um, cause, cause, you know, and then he got all pissed and put it back in the, ta it put it back in the truck and lifted back up the tailgate and said, put, it, put the couch up over top of it, man. You know, and... And he had told us, you know, uh, ahead of time, he was like, oh, my back is broken. Yeah, I think he actually said his back was broke. And then I went and bitched later afterwards, after it was all said and done. I went back in the break room and all that. I'm like, you know, is, everybody's, is everybody's back broken in this community, in this town, in this county? I mean, that, if it is, then, like, maybe we should just round everybody up and, and like, put them in some kind of, like, nursing home or whatever, uh, because they're just basically unable to do anything uh, useful to society. And, uh, you know, it's where I live at, it's, starting, it's going to have to become a cliche, you know, about having an injured back or whatever, because how, how, how is it possible that so many people in this area have, a, have an injured back? I do think it's an excuse a lot of times, but then again, even if it's true... You know, even if they really do have a bad back, what does that say about the intelligence level of the person who's got a bad back? You know, um, it's it says that this person wasn't smart enough to figure out how to lift something uh, without injuring themselves and all that. I mean, I'm 33 years old, and there are people who are younger than me that have messed up backs. I mean, no, 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 it's not, this is not like somebody that's 70 years old. You know, that I'm talking about that has, you know, a bad back. Some of these people are only 10 years older than me. Some of them are 5 or 6 years younger than me. You know what I'm saying? It's all different ages. I mean, generally a little more older, yes. But, you know, about my age on upward, you know. Um, but uh, some of them are younger than me. And, you know, I haven't got injured like that yet. Well, what am I doing right? You know, it's just weird. You know what I mean? So anyway, you know, the, these customers are rude and all that, and I just fucking got up in their truck and just, like, I, I was so fucking pissed at the situation. I, I mean, like, I was just, when I get pissed, I get invincible, apparently. And I just got up in there and just, like, got it all done, like, just fucking He-Man gung-ho sh shit, you know. And, um... And, uh, so anyway, and then, um, then the manager, the shift manager, was, was griping about how we need to change the policy to where we don't do customer carryout for the customers. And I said, yeah, I agree, but we, we you know, the corporate has dabbled in, in changing the policy. They, they changed the policy. This is back in, like, 2009. They did change the policy for, like, a couple weeks, but the customers fucking called in and complained to corporate, and they bitched so much that corporate basically decided to have us do carryout again. Um, because the customers are so fucking lazy in this area. They're so damn stupid. 
Not all of them, but too damn many of them. And they're selfish. They're so selfish and needy. I'm going to have to talk about this more in the future. Um, now, there's a guy uh, who works at a metal uh, forming facility, a factory basically, uh, nearby. And uh, actually just right over the hill from where I work. And, um, you know, very, very close. Uh, matter of fact, yeah, I said, like I said, you know, just kind of, you know, look out the window and you see it. This guy, he comes in in the store where I work and he never gives me a problem ever. As a matter of fact, he bought something today and I did carry out for him. And um, I uh, I told him, you know, I said, you know, when I took the stuff out to his car, I told him, it's like, hey, now since I got my opportunity, I need to tell you something. And I'm like, oh, yeah, what's that? And I said, you know, like, you are one of the very few customers who has never given me any trouble. And I said, I told him, it's like, you know, it's like, like, you're one of the few who has never given me any trouble or caused any problems or whatever. And he said, oh, I wouldn't cause any problems. I said, that's exactly what I, that's exactly what I see. Yeah. And the guy is just, he's well behaved. Um, you know, he doesn't try to hassle us on reducing the price or, you know, he doesn't break anything. He doesn't put anything in, uh, places where it doesn't belong, you know, like pick up merchandise, look at it and set it in a different part of the store. He's always very well behaved, keeps to himself and all that. And, um, even though it wasn't my job to do customer carry out, I decided to do it anyway. Cause, uh, you know, just to, as a reward to that guy to help him out because, of how well behaved he is. <clears throat> and I told him, you know, it's like, you know, even the fast food restaurants get subjected to these customers coming in and just being very selfish. And, you know, it's a form of robbery. You know, if you've ever noticed this in restaurants and other stores, what it is is the customer wants something for free or reduced price. They have a desire. They have a desire to have the situation, in this case, the sale accommodate them. Now, Okay, what they do is they're very selfish and they have a very selfish goal that serves only them and it comes at a cost to other people. Um, well, so what they do is, like the Amazing Atheist has actually um, commented on this recently in one of his videos and he did very good. Um, I like the way he expresses things. <clears throat> and because he does a pretty good, accurate job. And, um, anyway, um, he talks about how these customers go into a restaurant and they order a sandwich with extra mustard. And then whenever it's served to them, uh, they took, they take a look at it and throw it, they just throw it around, you know, they like throw it across the room, I think that's what he said. And they say, I told you no mustard. You know, it's like, I said no mustard. And then, yeah, and I, you know, I've seen that stuff before. I mean, for example, you know, uh, the other day, a few days ago, I went to uh, Wendy's uh, to eat. You know, that restaurant that the Disposable Human Doing uh, had worked at last year. And uh, the year of 2012. And, you know, the conspiracy theory about Wendy's in the area where I live is that they always get your order wrong. No, I've ate at Wendy's over a half dozen times. I've ate there more than a half dozen times. Even the other day, earlier this week, I ate there. I had no problem with Wendy's. Uh, they never get my order wrong. And I, like I said, I've, I've ate there more than a half dozen times. I ate there more than six times. And they've never gotten my order wrong. And then even when I complicate the order a little bit more, you know, specifying for them to not to not put any tomato on my sandwich, they still get it right. You know? And then, but when I'm in line, you know, um, at the front counter uh, at Wendy's, people in front of me in line and people behind me in line, they always bitch and whine and complain about their order being wrong. And they're trying to get it for free. And the disposable human doing, uh, you know, he told stories about all this. And, yeah, I've seen it so much. What it is, it's a form of robbery. Yes, I said robbery. 
unarmed robbery. <clears throat> and what they do is they go and they intentionally order something wrong. Or how they'll say wrong later on. They'll order it a certain way. Uh, and they get it that way, generally. But then they pretend that there's something wrong with their food. And then they take it up there, they complain, and then they pretend to be a very betrayed, unsatisfied customer. And what they do is they exploit the company's policy of satisfying the customer. And... Um, they basically use the threat of unemployment, which is a threat that, you know, that, that they will call into the business owner um, or corporation or whatever and then have that employee at the local business, you know, at the local, you know, location fired or whatever for not, satisf or for not satisfying the customer therefore causing that employee to be unemployed, which it has the potential for that person to not be able to find any, or t to not have any food, to not afford to eat, or have a place to live, or whatever, and basically to cause that employee's world to fall apart um, so that uh, a customer can have a free burger, extra fries, and another soft drink. Um... And businesses, you know, they're, they're willing to do this. And it's sad. Um, and what they do is they cause society to regress into a more primitive and selfish state of, of, of thinking and acting and behaving uh, because they're rewarding bad behavior. And why? All because that customer can then also threaten to tell all the other customers that that business is bad so then the business it just worries completely about whether or not they're going to get paid so they're going to lose money either way because of that customer because of this selfish customer now what i'm going to say is this is a lesson about selfishness and desire okay and this is this is something I want people to know. See, you know, the, the, the dangers of selfish desire is something that Freemasonry teaches, you know, its members about. Um, and, yeah, Freemasonry teaches people to be moral and upstanding and just all that. Yeah, they do. But, that's what I'm saying. How they do it is they teach... They teach about the destructiveness of, of selfish desire and just, and see, this is why I like Freemasonry so much. And keep in mind, I am not a Freemason and I have never been a Freemason before in my life. So I'm not a Freemason and I've never been one. But just studying some of their, you know, reading material, looking at their symbolism, just, you know, this and that. Uh, Freemasonry's got some good stuff. I know that Freemasonry gets a bad reputation. Um, a lot of it, once again, is because of human nature. Uh, you know, people are very ignorant. Um, you know, and, you know, they're, they're, they're unaware of what Freemasonry keeps secret. But honestly, you know, looking at this stuff that Freemasons are involved in, um... You know, like, I don't blame them for, like, keeping their stuff secret. I mean, and it's not even totally secret either. That's the thing. It's like, what it is, okay, it's like this. I, okay, a guy come into where I work today, and he wanted an application, and he was filling out the application, and I was talking to him and all that, and, uh, you know, he's like, oh, well, by the way, uh, I, you know, I'm a, I, I'm a tech guy. You know, I, I, I deal with technology and computers and all that. I'm like, oh, okay. Well, you know, I was talking about GPU computing. I was talking about, um, uh, you know, efficiency per watt of power. I was talking about TDP. I was talking about uh, multi-core processing. Um, I was talking about distributing uh, or distributed computing for uh, clustering. I was he was talking about cast latency 
on uh, memory. Um, we, we were talking about PCI Express buses. Uh, I was talking about how ARM uh, dominates the embedded and mobile platforms. So that microprocessor that was controlling his smartphone uh, was most likely, most likely of an ARM design. I was talking about, yeah, and I was talking about how you could take, um, you know, you could take, uh, what, um, you can take three dozen uh, of these little ARM uh, embedded single board computers and like, and like put them in something as small as a bathtub. You know, I told them that you can take 100, uh, 150 of these things and cluster them all together and get them to all interoperate together all at the same time and not even pull enough electrical power to trip a circuit breaker in a house. You know, because of, you know, how much computing power these things have given how much, you know, or how little amount of electricity they use. So, we're, you know, I was talking about computers and the customers were walking by and they overheard and they said, well, it might as well be all Greek to me. And see, that's an example. This stuff isn't secret. You can go buy a technical manual off of the shelf of a bookstore or order them off of Amazon or go read Wikipedia or read the manufacturer's website. None of this stuff is really secret, you know, but yet people in society don't know about it. And that's kind of how Freemasonry is. I mean, honestly, in my opinion, it's not, it's not overwhelmingly difficult to figure out what Freemasonry is about. You know, I watched an, an interview to where, ah, I forgot this dude's last name, or this, well, this guy's name, but um, I think he lives and works in Washington, D.C., and he is, um, he's very well, well, actually, he is a Freemason, but, like, he works for some kind of Freemasonic organization or whatever, and, um, and... <clears throat> he um he talks about how how amazed he was to notice how accurately uh you know how accurate Dan Brown understood the concepts of freemasonry and and groups like that uh while not ever being a freemason uh this guy said you know I you know, and and that guy's not a mason, but he he has such a he has such a wonderful understanding of what Freemasonry is about. You know, I don't know how he did it. Now, this guy, you know, is puzzled to under to 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 find out that like somebody who's not a Freemason has such an accurate understanding of the concepts of Freemasonry. I mean, it's no surprise to me. I mean. I've got some Masonic books, and, you know, I haven't read very much into them, but what I did read uh, was good. Well, actually, one book I had read, um, it was written by a, uh, a Freemason, uh, C.W. Leadbeater, or however you pronounce that. Um, um, it's, oh gosh, like, uh, it's a reprint, but it's like Freemasonry, it's Ancient Mystic Rites, or whatever. And but I didn't know it was written by a Freemason. I actually thought it was like one of those conspiracy theory kind of related books or whatever. And I'm reading it, you know, and I just jumped around from part to part. And uh, I was reading it, and uh, I said, you know, I kind of said to myself, "It's like, man, this guy really understands Freemasonry and all that." And then later on in the book, I was reading where he says, "You know, we, you know, do the, you know." Um, we do these things in our temples when we practice our craft. And I'm like, what? And then later on, I looked toward the front of the book and saw the, the picture of the author in his full Masonic regalia. Uh, 33rd, you know, honorary 33rd degree uh, Scottish Rite Freemason and all that. And it told more about him. And I'm like, oh, no wonder he understands so much about Freemasonry. Um, but, um... And I watched several videos put out by uh, Masonic organizations and this and that. And, um, and <clears throat> um, of course, I read, uh, read uh, the first, I forget how many pages of uh, Manly P. Hall's book um, called um, 
the ancient key, or like the lost keys of Freemasonry, which was written years before he even joined the fraternity or became a Freemason and all that. And, uh, well, mainly P. Hall had a huge understanding about Freemasonry before he even joined up. Um, and, oh my gosh, that just... And the, the depictions, you know, for some of the pictures and the explanations and captions and all that, it's pretty good, you know. They talk about mastering the lower self. Uh, and basically, it... You know, you want honestly. You know, you want to know what what a lot of Freemasonry is about. I mean, yeah, it is about being a better person, but it's about conquering selfish, destructive desire. And you know, I notice that's a theme that keeps coming up in Freemasonry. I'm like, you know, that's really good. That that's kind of like the ant and the grasshopper kind of stuff, sort of. I mean, it's like. Oh my gosh, and, and uh, you know, with after, you know, learning and studying about Freemasonry and just, you know, really thinking about what I read and, and just what I see and, and how they conduct themselves and all, it's like, no wonder that they, you know, that the Freemasons use work-related tools and all their other theming and all that that they use. See, Freemasonry is so heavily themed and that's part of why people don't understand it. But, I mean, it's like... Oh my gosh, it's... It is... Maybe that's why, some, why it seems so mysterious to people is because... Like, Freemasonry has so much to tell that they basically can't even do it with words. They have to use, like, symbols and all kind of other stuff to do it. And it's pretty good. I mean, honestly... Um... You know, I don't know everything about it, but, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's about learning, bettering one's own self. You know, they, they teach a lot about selflessness, the value of work, the value of learning, and your self See, that's the thing, self-development, and just, I mean, oh my, God. well, I'll just tell you this, it's some pretty good stuff. And that's what me and the Disposable Human doing, we like it. Now, now he's not a Freemason either. Uh, he's never been one. Um, but, uh, anyway, of course, Freemasonry also gets a bad reputation because it's a men's only organization. And, uh, yeah, that'll tell you a lot right there. Once again, it's another male oriented space in which females desperately want to gain admittance to. But, you know, Freemasons defend, you know, that, that, you know, and, like, they just, and, and, you know, I support them in that, in that regard. I mean, they, like, that should be at least the one, you know, safe place for a man, you know, to just be as intelligent and as wise and intuitive as he can, as he can develop into becoming, and it's sad, you know, that, that women won't just let men be men and, like, have their own space like that. And I remember, this is back in December of 2011, uh, when I was talking to some Freemasons at the local lodge. And, oh my gosh, my, my former owner was so freaking, like, just jealous and all that. And... Uh, and a lot of, actually, a lot of women are. You'd be surprised how many women are jealous of Freemasons or are very distrustful. Uh, <clears throat> and, uh, you know, it's because there was a wedding that occurred there at the uh, Masonic Lodge. And my former owner seen it. And, uh, <laughs> oh my gosh, you know what my former owner was saying about the Freemasons? She said that they get drunk and have orgies with women, and then sacrifice those women to the devil. Um, all without proof, of course. Yeah. And so, like, like about a week after that wedding, I go in and talk to the Freemasons there. Um, and they offer me, uh, you know, I, I, all I wanted to do is just talk to them, and all that. And, well, yeah, they did talk to me, and they, and, and, you know, because uh, they were all leaving from their meeting, because while they are having their meeting, I'm like, I'm thinking somebody's going to be around there to, like, 
you know. And um, anyway, I had to catch them at the end of the meeting when they were leaving. You know, I talked to them, and a couple of them went back in. They took me back in. You know, they took me into the building. You know, into the main hall or whatever. And this building is a, is a nice old building. I like the style it was from 1928. It just seems like a really well, just the architecture style is really cozy and all that. But anyway, um, pre uh, Great Depression era. Anyway. Um, so yeah, and they're like, would you like some cake? And I'm like, what are you, what are you trying to do, get rid of it? And he's like, well, yeah. I'm like, cool, all right. So he gave me and the disposable human doing some cake. And then he, well, you want something to drink? I'm, okay, cool, what you got? Um, we got Pepsi? I'm like, yeah, fine, yeah, cool. So sitting there eating cake, talking to him and all that. And, um, anyway... And uh, I need to call some of them people back, but uh, it's just, oh my gosh, like, people hate Freemasonry for no legitimate reason, and that's sad. And you know what, this, like, um, and here's, here's the problem that me and the disposable human doing have with Freemasonry, <laughs> is that people don't take it seriously enough, it's like... You know, we hear all these stories about how, like, they'll go through all the degrees, you know, and uh, and then they'll, they'll, they'll just keep paying their dues and, like, sit on the couch and retire and watch TV and, like, like that's it, you know, and they just keep paying their dues. So, yeah, they can be called a Freemason and all that, but, like, they don't, as far as I know or as far as I hear, they don't really study any more of it or participate in events or whatever, and... Yeah, Freemasonry, they're known for having, you know, uh, or the, you know, the, the ancient accepted order of Freemasons. They're known for having fish fries and all that. And, you know, all that stuff's great. You know, I'm, I'm not into eating fish uh, or any, anything that lives in water. Um, but, like, there, there is so much to learn within Freemasonry. And, you know, I... I could tell, I mean, see, I, I've never, you know, been a Freemason before, so I've not ever taken an oath. You know, I've, you know, I'm not under any obligation to keep anything secret, but yet I feel like, yeah, I mean, why should I go around telling everybody? It, well, it's just like, it's just like with computers, you know? I, I'm legally allowed to tell, you know, people all kind of things about computers, but that doesn't mean I'm going to tell everybody. Or tell anybody necessarily because, first of all, nobody wants to listen. Nobody wants to be bothered with that. Same thing about Freemasonry. You know, if I go to tell people what Freemasonry is about, people aren't going to, they're not even going to comprehend it. So what's the point in even trying to tell them? Um, but, uh, you know, for men wanting to have a men's only, you know, or get involved with a men's only you know, kind of organization and, and better themselves. Uh, yeah, Freemasonry, I think, should be for you. Uh, take it seriously. There is a whole lot to learn. And, and yeah, their treasure really is knowledge and wisdom. Um, and keep in mind, they pretty much have to do what they do in order to teach what they know because it's just about the only realistic, practical way. And keep in mind the theming of work. You know what I'm saying? It's like... You know, they work hard mentally and all that. I mean, now now we got, you know, modern construction machines, so there's not the need for like all kind of like physical labor, but but they use that as a theme to teach with, to use and to teach it, you know, like um you know, symbolically, like just as the ancient stonemasons were skilled in their their trade of building and all that, and they understood the value of work and then, you know, how that Brings you what you want to have in life. Well, like, on, and here's the thing with Freemasonry. It's like, it's kind of one and the same with, like, mental work or, like, you know, like, to do the work of understanding things and, and build up your mind and to build better character in yourself and just all kind of stuff, you know, kind of one and the same. And it, it, actually, you know what? Atlas Shrugged. Uh, I got the book written by Ayn Rand. I haven't read it yet because I'm not finished reading The Manipulated Man by Esther Villar. Um, 
by the disposable human doing, I think he said he finished reading uh, the disposable human. Or I mean, not yeah, the disposable human doing. I think he said he finished reading. Uh, you know, the uh, manipulated man. I think he said he read it all. And then he f recently finished reading Atlas Shrugged because it's like 1,100 pages, you know, Atlas Shrugged. And yeah, you know, the value of work and all that. And it's like, once again, it's, it's the rehashed story of the ant and the grasshopper, more or less, but with a twist because, you know, it's not only, well, it's kind of, it's, it's really similar, you know, it's basically from what he describes, you know, Atlas Shrugged. It's basically all these mentally lazy people that don't want to do anything to benefit themselves, but they want everybody else to do other things to benefit them. And it's just, it's a story of selfishness gone to, you know, a, a very high order of magnitude or whatever. And, you know, the, the thinkers and movers of the world, you know, people that are, you know, that, that know how to invent things and really know how to do things and... and you know, they're the ones who get tired of all the stupid people just pulling them down and expecting, you know, the, these smart people to be like Atlas and just hold up the world and all that. So, um, so there you go and just, you know, move away and go live in a commune somewhere and just let all the dumb people collapse the world. And all that, and it's just, it's sad, you know, and it reminds me of like, you know, a person who decides to put effort into learning how things work, and all that, is like a person who learned how to swim. So when they get in water, it's not really any problem, you know, they can take care of themselves. But all the other people who don't care to learn any, anything about anything, and just prefer to be stupid, and have everybody do things for them, and, and to accommodate them, well, when they get in water, you know, those people are in danger of drowning because they never learned how to swim. See the similarities and all that? Well, so what do they do? They want the one, you know, the, the person who can swim, they want that person to save them and all that. Well, what happens? The person, you know, the person who can swim is like, okay. Well, then the, the, the ignorant person that never learned how to swim... They're so panicked, you know, consumed in their fear, their emotion, their lower self. Uh, you know, consumed by all these primitive, just self-centered things. And they're, so, and they're so ignorant about their situation, they don't even realize that if they cooperate with the smart person that knows how to swim, then the situation will be just fine. No, so what the so what the you know the dumb person that never learned how to swim, what they do is they panic and all that, and they're 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 trapped within their their lower self as then you know description of all this you know this is the easy way to describe it. Uh, they're they're um, they're confined within basically their limitations, and they end up putting the, the smart person that learned how to swim at risk of being drowned themselves. You know, they pull that, that smart person down with them and all that. And it's just, it's, it, this is how selfishness works. And th these are the kind of lessons that Freemasonry teaches. And this is perhaps just one of the reasons why I like Freemasonry so much. You know what I'm saying? I mean, one of these days I might become a Freemason... But, you know, until that time comes, I'm still learning the lessons and stuff and all that. And, you know, if I become a Freemason, fine. You know, if I don't, then, hey, I'm still doing good. And, uh, <clears throat> and uh, so anyway, um, you know, the more I learn about Freemasonry, the more I learn about why they do what they do, and the more I approve of it. So that's the thing, it's just, people could benefit from Freemasonry. So anyway, back to what was going on at work. So uh, after I got interrupted, um, uh, it was about 6.35 p.m., which now it's 8.01 p.m., um, you know, Gunsley had me um, T 
teach her how to deal with that computer problem or whatever because she chooses not to learn. And then the uh, the assistant store manager um, wanted me to help Gunsley take out trash or like do trash for her or whatever. You know, all females and all that. So I'm like, okay. So Gunsley, you know, because I was told that, well, well, Gunsley needs to keep scanning books. And and basically made it sound like Gunsley shouldn't be interrupted, you know, that she shouldn't have her job in, uh, that she shouldn't have her job interrupted and all that. But yet, taking out trash is one of her, you know, one of the main responsibilities for the area of the store that she was working in. It wasn't even my job to do. <clears throat> but I, I obey the manager anyway, so I go put in my earplugs because, you know, the trash compactor is loud and all that. And um, I'm dealing with broken glass. It's always loud. And I put on my safety gloves and the, the safety eye glass things and all that. So I go to take out the trash cans and all the broken stuff and just whatever. I go to take it, you know, to the compactor, and then Gunsley says, Why well, are you going out there by yourself? I'm like, I always do. That's what I told And I was just telling her really plain, you know. And, you know, because that's to the point in which, you know, I'm just tired of getting mad at people for being stupid. So I just, just say what stuff really means and just be very, very direct. And I said, yeah, I always do. It's like, apparently I'm the only person who can do it by myself and all that, or who the only person who will. And it's like, yeah, yeah, I'll, yeah, it's like, you know, I'll do it by myself. You know, I worked all day without getting any help, and I got behind in my job because everybody else needed me to help them and all that, and just I went on explaining all this kind of stuff. And I know it's very foreign and alien sounding to them because, you know, they're so accustomed to having everybody help them and accommodate them and just, you know, and to serve them and all that. Um, so I go out there and, you know, these trash cans, you know, they get filled with stuff and, you know, they're a bit heavy sometimes. Now, recently, well, I've always been able to pretty much lift them up, you know, up to my shoulders and all that and dump them in there. But recently, I guess I've become so physically strong now, pick up a trash can full of stuff and these are the big trash cans, you know, these are like um, around 30 gallon, maybe a little bit more, uh, 30 to 40 gallon trash cans. Um, and uh, yeah, at least 30 gallon trash cans. Uh, and because uh, I'm looking at, at 30, I'm looking at, yeah, it's around a 30 gallon that I bought last year. And I got a 33 gallon bag in there. And yeah, so that's the size. Yeah, and that, but that's the smallest size trash can we deal with. Some are bigger than that, so they're at least forty gallon. <clears throat> you know, I just this thing's full of trash. You just pick it up. Uh, take my left arm, grab the handle, pick it up, and I'm apparently strong enough to get it up off the ground. And then I take my right hand, and while I'm leaning over my side, uh, you know, not bending down, but like leaning, you know, to my side pick it up, and then um, basically just work my, sho my shoulders and my side muscles or whatever. And, you know, and then I end up lifting it. And then I lift it above my head, and I can hold it above my head for I forgot how many seconds. I never even, well, I mean, I can hold it for probably a minute if I wanted to. And then just dump it out, you know. Like, these are the same trash cans that other people won't pick up by themselves. You know, I sit on my ass all the time when in my free time, you know, I'm in this apartment sitting in a computer chair or sitting on the couch. I don't own any exercise equipment. You know, I don't exercise. I mean, apparently I get a lot of exercise at work, you know. Um, there's a reason why only I wear steel toe work boots at work. Everybody else, you only wear their sneakers and you know, nice looking shoes or whatever, because, you know, they don't know any better. And, um, you know, I tuck my, my uh, pant legs into my boots, which I don't like doing because it's not really, really comfortable, although I'm getting really used to it now. I don't even notice. And I do that so my legs don't, or my pants legs don't snag on stuff and trip me. Uh, we had somebody uh, who's out on surgery, uh, you know, out on medical leave because they had surgery because, well, they basically fell and messed up their arm because they had their pant legs out, you know, looking all nice and stuff. 
and weren't being careful and all that. Um, and, uh, you know, and then so, um, yeah. And then that was a female that that happened to. And then another person, a uh, female, like last month or whatever, dropped a television on her foot and messed up her foot. Um, probably because she wasn't being careful enough. But yeah, and then she had to miss a whole bunch of work to go to the doctor here and there and, you know, all that. And, um, well, if she would have wore steel toe uh, work boots, you know, that probably wouldn't have happened. But no, she chose to offer the, you know, or she chose she chose to wear these nice, fashionable sneakers that offer like no protection, but they look really good and all that, and because that's what's important to her. And uh, this is uh, the same person who me and the disposable human doing regard as the h hormone rager. Uh, we're we're looking for we've called her mustache before, but we're looking for a new nickname or a code name for her. Uh, she's got hormone raging right now. She's baby craving. You know, she wants to get pregnant and all that. I could just tell. She won't shut up about her nephew. And she's like, oh, I love my Eli. Well, Eli is not even her kid. It's her sister's kid. I'll worry someday she'll fucking abduct that kid. But see, the kid is just an object of focus. You know, this girl wants validation like so much. See what it is. She went to college for a bit. I don't think she finished college. And she knows that she doesn't really have much of a future and all that because she's so inept and just... I mean, she's not, like, mentally retarded or anything like that. Um, um, but, you know, she just, you know, she got... Uh, lived in the country! And anyway... And if people think that, that I have a southern accent, they should hear this person. Uh, you know, this person just doesn't know much about anything and this and that. I think she feels like she doesn't really have much of a future. So the only thing she can really do is just basically get pregnant, pop out a kid, and be a mother. You know what I'm saying? Default to that. Uh, just like men usually default to military service. Um, anyway, um, yeah, and she keeps... She's off again, on again with... with this one guy and then another guy, she breaks up with him almost every week and then gets back with him. And it only lasts for a few weeks at a time or maybe a month at a time or whatever. She can't seem to be satisfied. And I doubt it's the guy's fault because I've seen the guy and I've seen the way he acts. He, he, he's just too much of a freaking nice guy. And um, he's probably not giving her the drama in which she desires because I know she's she's into that Tim Burton stuff. She She... You know, has a Jack Skellington keychain and just you know, you know, skulls and and and, and anime and and drama and Twilight and just all this stuff. Um, she's got tattoos, nose piercings, and all that. Uh, coloring in her hair, she dyes it black, and then puts like a green streak in there, and then had a blue streak in it. And just all this stuff. Just many indicators and all that. Um, and uh, she's been spazzing out lately. Like, you know, um, you know, I found an HDMI cable today and I was, I was pricing it, you know. And I had actually taken it out of her cart because she had like, fuck, like, I don't know, like 50 cents or a dollar on it or whatever. And I'm like, that's an HDMI cable. And that's a 12-foot HDMI cable. And it's a nice brand name HDMI cable. Uh, it's going to get more than $1.50 or whatever. You know, so I put $3 on there. But fuck, that's still a steal. Because I, I had debated putting like 5 on there and all that. Because I know how much that stuff costs. But yeah, I still put $3 on 12-foot HDMI cable. She got all pissed off at me. You know, like... Man, <laughs> like, you know, it's like, well, there's nothing wrong with it. It's like, yeah, it's too cheap. Well, it's already priced in the cart. And I'm like, I just had to basically just try to ignore her shit, you know. And, you know, it's like, well, you know, man, whenever I work this job, you know, management usually comes and rummages through my stuff. And, and um, 
you know, and reprice the stuff and all that. And she's like, wash management. I'm like, yeah, well, other people do it too, okay? So go pet one. And that's what I said to her and all that. And it's just like, you know, see the entitlement, the privilege, you know, where she can just fucking bitch at me for, like, no legitimate reason and all that. And she's getting on some other people's nerves too, but just... You can tell boys are on her mind a whole bunch, the way she talks and acts. And, wow, just imagine when girls are on a guy's mind. Well, we know guys only have one thing on their mind, sticking their dick in a girl. <sighs> they, they have, like, women are, usually females are totally oblivious to what really goes on in, like, psychological, you know, like, in the psychological sense of, of a man or even a woman's mind. Um... You know, and it just shows. See, women have no Harry Harlow. They have no equivalent. And go look up Harlow's Monkeys. And I'm so glad that, that you know, Barbarossa did this video. Because Barbarossa, um, he's amazing. Um, and uh, it's sad that he gets bogged down with, you know, dealing with traditionals and conservatives and, and rebutting their stuff and all that. And same thing with Stardust. These are great people and just, anyway, um, uh, it's just sad what they have to end up going through. Knowing, you know, the, the potential that Barbarossa and Stardust have and how intelligent they are. And they just, they just get their time basically wasted trying to educate these dumb people that, like, will just never probably ever get it, you know? And, um, so anyway, I might, <laughs> I might try to recruit Stardust and Barbarossa for, a <laughs> oh, think tank, yeah. But, uh, I, I received written permission from both Barbarossa and Stardust, uh, to distribute uh, their content. I've received written permission. Oh, yeah. And uh, it's pretty good. And, um, and uh, yeah. And uh, so uh, those guys are really good. Girl Writes What is really good, too. Now, there's a lot of... There's, you know, in some of the men... You know, there's some men in the men's movement that totally disregard Girl Writes What and think that she's leading people astray. But uh, no, 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 no. Girl writes what has a clue, and uh, this is why I appreciate her uh, her contributions and her efforts so much. Um, and uh, I mean, see, girl, okay, uh, of the people in the men's movement, I'd have to say Barbarossa, Stardust, and Girl Writes What really have the. They are my type of people. And what I mean by that, it's not just that I like what they say or whatever. They are like the thinking analyst to like, they're kind of like, I mean, you know, they're, you know, intelligent, kind of like Harry Harlow or like, I don't know, I mean, like, I mean, they are. They're very, very, you know, they are really trying to figure out the, the gender problem and all that. And, you know, they come probably the closest. Um, now, I'm relatively unknown compared to these people. But uh, eventually, I mean, I've already been in contact with all three of those people. But there's a time coming to where, like, all three of them are going to have to become co uh, colleagues with myself and we're we're just going to have to like you know what I'm saying like really cooperate and work together on this kind of stuff um and become like colleagues in in a field of of work or whatever because because if we don't then there's so much stuff there's so much potential that will probably end up being squandered um, because I feel kind of isolated away from, like, a bunch of the criticism and skepticism, you know, and, and, and resistance. Because, like, few people really comment on my channel much anymore. And, like, I mean, now, now I'm sure Barbarossa and Stardust and all them, they receive a lot of, you know, criticism. I mean, they, you know, they receive some praise also, and it's much well-deserved. Uh, some of it comes from me. <laughs> um, but, 
you know, they're, they're so, you know, so many people know about those guys, and that's probably why, you know, they, they get so much resistance, you know, people commenting and, and, and uh, you know, negatively or just basically displaying their ignorance level at, at Barbarossa and Stardust um, and all that. Well, maybe I got the benefit of not having all that um, exposure like that because I just, you know, focus and just analyze. You know, people ask me, you know, it's like, why do I continue to work my job if so many aspects of my job get on my nerves? And I tell you what, you know, I mean, yeah, I'm working my job does pay the bills, and that's probably the biggest reason why I do it. But, honestly, I got the added perk that, yeah, I work a job that, that, that gets on my nerves and people would get frustrated at if they had to do it. But it's such a it's such an excellent learning experience to learn human psychology. You know, because I'm around the public like every day. I get to see so many people's selfish, destructive nature like literally on an hourly basis. I mean, fuck, the amount of learning that I go through like every damn day that I work there. The, oh my gosh. This is why I encourage people to work shit jobs. I mean, yeah, I would like to have a nice... I don't know, maybe an IT job or just whatever, or a laboratory job or whatever. You know, when I was in the Army, I worked in a lab a little bit. Um, um, and all, just, you know, filling in when they needed, like, extra help or whatever. It was actually an optometry lab. It's a nice environment, you know, and you can just sit there and focus on doing your work. And that's probably what's good about it, you know, and... Yeah. And everybody's laid back, even your supervisors, well, which in that case were, were sergeants, and all that, and it's like, you almost forget that you're in the army. I mean, really, you kind of do. I mean, when I was in there, it's like, yeah, they're all wearing uniform, and they have rank insignia, and all this other stuff. But like, but it's like, you know, it's like you forget about that because the environment is so relaxed. You know, you're just listening to the radio, cleaning all that freaking, well, it amounts to, it's, I mean, you know how with wood you have sawdust? Well, when you're cutting polycarbonate and other types of plastics, you have something that's kind of similar. Cleaning that stuff off of eyeglass lenses, putting the eyeglass lenses in the frames, packaging them up, putting them in the, putting them in the right mailbox... All this kind of stuff, you know, and I did this stuff for a little while, and it's like, oh my gosh, it's just like, it, it's, it was it was good, you know, I mean, it's just like, and you know, and some people chit-chat and all that, but like, you don't even feel like you have to chit-chat, it's just like, you just do your job, and you just, I don't know, I, I thought it was pretty good, and, um, you know, when you have to talk to your supervisor, who is a sergeant, you know, a non-commissioned officer and all that, you know, they don't yell at you, they don't even, like, piss you off, they're just, it was pretty relaxed, it's just like, you just ask them plainly, it's like, and then they give you an answer, and then it's just, it was just good, you know what I mean? <clears throat> um, well, this is back in early 2001, um, but, uh, so anyway, um, yeah, and, uh, so, I mean, yeah, I mean, even, if, I mean, yeah, there would be the, the perks and benefits of, like, having a better stress-free job, uh, that pays more money, but then I wouldn't get all this physical fitness, um, and I wouldn't have all this shit to deal with that actually educates me. I mean, like, <clears throat> You know, I guess Barbarossa and Stardust would be, I guess, appalled or whatever. Um, maybe they would understand, but like, you know, I surround myself by what's regarded as misandric uh, uh, crap. I surround myself with it, you know, from the types of movies that I watch to the type of list music I listen to. Honestly, I like video game music, you know, from like back in the day. And I like Steve Vai. And Joe Satriani, yeah, Valen Halen's good. I mean, but anyway, that's like, you know, my you know, my my favorite stuff. You know what I'm saying? 
And I don't even listen to that anymore, really. Um, most of what I listen to, you know, Katy Perry, uh, Taylor Swift, uh, Kelly Clarkson, Beyonce, Nicki Minaj, um, just a bunch of these pop singers, especially female. <clears throat> and yeah, a lot of what's what would be regarded as misandric stuff, very misandric and all that. Just listen to and just eat it up. You know why? Because it keeps me honed to a fine edge. You know, a nice, you know, focused beam. It keeps me in the zone, I guess you could say. Learning and analyzing. And I need to study, you know, women's toxic behavior. And it's just not, I mean, it's not just women. I mean, you know, when you go in this, you know, in, in a restaurant or whatever, there, I mean, there's there's... Men behaving selfishly, there's women behaving selfishly. So you learn the common denominator that it's a human problem. However, the female, here's the unique thing, the female can usually get away with it much better, <clears throat> and there's, there's reasons why. Uh, and that's the thing. Uh, that's something that me and the disposable human doing, you know, of course I'm manslave, but, uh, you know, me and the disposable human, do, human doing you know, DHD, we, we study this stuff so much. You know, you take human nature and then you you put that within a, in a, you take that and put it within uh, a gender and then it becomes a unique subset of human nature. Um, that's, I have to get into more of this kind of stuff, but, um, Right now, Barbarossa, Stardust, and Girl Writes What are the only people on YouTube right now who can actually really, really kind of match my level of, uh, of, of you know, research, study, and, and intelligence, and, and comprehension level. Man, Woman, Myth is really good. He's very general, though. Uh, and he doesn't really get into, although he's a psychologist, I think that's his job uh, that he works, uh, he doesn't really go off into explaining the really fine details a whole lot, or at least as much as they could be explained, because he's focusing on so many other things, and so he does a very general overview. Uh, but he's still good, though. Uh, that's no disrespect toward uh, man, woman, myth. He is, he is, he's amazing. He is very necessary. He's very good for a general education. It's just that Barbarossa, Stardust, and Girl Writes What go into the more advanced things than what man, woman, myth typically does, and it's and it's all these advanced things which become a realm for me to reside in in my focus and my studies. And I feel like I'm, I'm in my studies and all that about the gender problem. I feel like I'm advancing toward Barbarossa, Stardust, and, and uh, Girl Writes What's Level. And I'm start. I feel like because of the results of what I, I, you know, come up with and all that. I feel like at some point, if I keep pursuing this at the intensity that I do and learn the things that I learn that I might eventually surpass them if they don't accelerate or whatever. But that's fine. You know, we're each our own people and all that. But, you know, but the thing is, they just, you know, Barbarossa, Stardust, and Girl Writes What, along with Man, Woman, Myth, and other people... Uh, who are my favorites, they, you know, but those three, uh, Barbarossa, Stardust, and Girl Writes What, have really earned a tremendous amount of respect because of their accomplish, uh, because of their accomplishments in understanding this gender problem. Rocking Mr. E, as much as some people uh, complain about him, he, st he has still made some significant contributions that deserve respect. Uh, I respect Rocking Mr. E uh, for his accomplishments and, and, and for, well, I would say probably for his contributions in, you know, understanding the gender problem. Uh, he has done some good work. However, his limitation is 
uh, <clears throat> you know, that, that he's very family-centric, and that's good. That's not wrong. However, it holds him back from really, it seems to me as if that holds him back and keeps him from truly understanding the magnitude of evil that the female gender is capable of doing and the damage path that could be created by the double X chromosome. Um, that's the problem I got with rocking Mr. E. Uh, I intend for no disrespect. You know, I, I don't intend any disrespect toward rocking Mr. E. Uh, but when push comes to shove, I, I would have to tell him that it's like, hey, buddy, we're just going to have to leave you behind. You know, and uh, and that sort of thing. Uh, still be friends, but in terms of research and, and development and study um, into understanding the gender problem, you know, we're just going to have to go our separate ways. Um, <clears throat> and all that. Um, you know, and, you know, from what I've been learning and all that in my studies... Oh yeah, I mean, you know, like like all these these you know these uh, these gynocentric bigots. Yeah, they should be, you know, told you know where they can go stick it. But I do not approve of of like you know threats or you know or hacking their account or anything really hard like that. Uh, because here's the thing: it enables them to gain more power because it puts them in a position to where they can they can claim victimhood and get sympathy and trust. Uh, I understand if you might be, you know, very frustrated at the Femetheist or, you know, or any of these other gynocentric bigots out there. I understand and I sympathize with your frustration. However, you... <laughs> You need to ease off with your methods. Um, you know, the reason why is because actually you are empowering these people and making them more powerful. And they're always going to find a way to get the power. So it's not that you should not oppose them. It's that you need to find a more effective method, honestly. And uh, and if you got a problem with my advice about this, buddy, you can go pet one. Okay, uh, that's if you got a problem, you know. Um, and uh, Monker Lord is going to send you on a trip to the ocularium, you know, if you got a problem with it. Um, so anyway, you got to learn and be wise so you can be more effective. It's just like them dumbasses that break their back all the time or, or that they injure their back or pull a muscle or whatever. It's because they don't know how to lift something without injuring themselves. You see? It's not that they shouldn't try to lift something heavy. It's that they should be careful so that they don't injure themselves in the process. Well, that's for that unique application of uh, the situation or whatever. Uh, it's 8.30 p.m., I am Manslave. I run the Validation Warfare YouTube channel. Um, you can find me on Skype as Validation Warfare. Uh, I call myself Manslave. Uh, you can find me on Facebook. You know, I'm connected, although I've been really bogged down with a project lately and that sort of thing. Um, anyway, um, I thought I was the, the only technically inclined person in the entire men's movement. I found out there's some other people, and I'm glad. I mean, yeah, it sounds all nice to be the most tech-savvy person in the entire men's movement, but it's got its problems, you know what I'm saying? Because if I don't know how to do something, it won't get done. Luckily, there's some other people who I can, um, who I can uh, work with on some stuff, and I'm about to call one of them in a few minutes. Um... Air Hour. They tell me uh, that he's uh, really smart on this kind of stuff. He likes the GNU Linux operating system just like I do. He even knows how to program, which I know just a tiny bit about it. I, I understand the concept pretty good. I just haven't really put it into practice very much. Um, and, uh, yeah, so... Uh, and he just lives literally in the next state over. I mean, you know, on, on a 
on a world map, you know, him and me are neighbors. <laughs> so uh, anyway, yeah. Um, and I'll contact some more people. Oh my gosh, I just I just feel so well connected. I mean, I talk to like people from like eight different countries on like five different continents. You know, I talk to a guy in South Africa. I got sometimes I talk to a guy in Russia. I talk to a guy in Israel. A guy in the UK. Actually, that this is all on Skype with voice. Because I know some other people in the UK also. But anyway, talking with voice uh, over Skype, you know, in the, and then the UK. There's a guy in Argentina. Well, that's South America right there. Of course, several people in North America. Um, oh, gosh, there's some other countries also. Um, but, uh, yeah. And... Um, so anyway, and, and in terms of like being connected with people that are uh, on uh, Facebook chat or just on Facebook, yeah, uh, several people in India, um, and then uh, not really anybody in Asia, that's, that's, that's sad, uh, you know, well, India is kind of regarded as Asia, but I'm talking, you know, I wish there were more people from like Korea or Japan or China or Vietnam or any of these places, you know, it's just, but not a lot of them, you know, are in the men's movement that I'm, that I'm aware of. Um, yeah, and then I talked to more people, you know, on Facebook, I talked to more people in uh, the UK, um, you know, and then, um, there might be some more people from South America or Central America. Uh, more people from the United States, of course. You know, that's where I'm from. Um, but, yeah, and uh, there's one dude. Uh, I think he's from, like, is he from... Oh, it's from... It's like the northwestern part of uh, Africa, I think. Is he from Morocco or whatever? I'm not sure, but anyway... It's nice to be connected with all these people in different countries to learn more about, you know, and, and to talk with these people and all that, and it's just great. So anyway, once again, I'm Manslave, Validation Warfare, uh, 8.33 p.m. on April 17th, 2013.